military is taking chips from dishwashers and refrigerators to fix their military hardware. Russia's industry is in tatters. Putin is now isolated from the world more than he has ever been. The Soviet Union itself is no more. The United States military has begun strikes. Считаю, что для современного мира однополярная модель не только неприемлема, но и вообще невозможна. in terms of uh, the whatever next step they want to pursue, and that's a sovereign decision, of course, that our Israeli counterparts have to make. Uh, but I don't think you can look at what happened last night in any way, shape, or form and not come away convinced that the president meant every word he said, ironclad commitment. Ironclad commitment from President Biden. Do you agree, Rebecca? Well, I think it's important that we remember that he also said that the United States had an ironclad commitment to NATO. And so how... President Biden then acts if Israel does decide to retaliate and how the United States comes to Israel's defense has significant geopolitical implications to other regions of the world. So we'll see what he means by ironclad. The other thing I think is really important to remember on the point of missile defense, because you asked Lucas Tomlinson about, about missile defense. It is true that Israel's missile defense, layered missile defense system performed beautifully mm -hmm. with the help of Jordan, with the help of the United States and even the Brits. But that does not mean that, that Israel now is required to sort of say, and now we're done. In order to restore deterrence and for missile defense to play its rightful part in deterrence is that you convince the adversary that he went ahead and tried to do this, he failed, but now he's going to be on the receiving end of retaliation. That's how you communicate that missile defense has a key part of deterrence. What's your assessment, Colonel? Well, listen, I think it's, uh, it's critical that we take a look at what happened here. Why is it that Iran, for the first time in history, as, as Trey Yings mentioned there, did they attack into Israel proper? Because of what happened on April 1st, where Israel chose to take out a, a, an assassinated general, not like they had done to the 17 previous, because they've been doing this for a while, they chose to strike in a diplomatic facility. The, the most uh, in-your-face emotional kind of target you can get that almost any country in the world would respond to. That it breaks any kind of international law to take out a diplomatic facility. Doesn't matter what country you're from, we're signatory to it, so it's Israel. And this is the response. So it's, I've seen too many people are characterizing this as an attack out of nowhere, and they're just attacking. They responded to what Israel did first, and that you can't let that go. How significant is the escalation? We've seen the proxies obviously doing a lot of the dirty work for the Iranian regime, but this was an attack launched from Iranian soil. 
Right. It was, it was the first time that there was an attack launched from Iranian soil. Um, I disagree that because the Iranians are operating um, in other places, including in, 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 in consulates in Syria, that that gives them immunity if they are the ones that are launching, funding, training the attacks that are constantly barraging Israel. Israel has the right to defend itself. And so there should be no sanctuary for where Iran is hiding its IRGC commanders and where they are. Um, on the point about escalation, this administration, the Biden administration, has been almost obsessively concerned about about escalation. But the way you deal with escalation is you turn to the adversary and convince the adversary not to escalate. You do not restrain your ally because that just means that U.S. allies are in a losing position because the United States is shackling them. So I would say that the best way to deal with escalation is to fully back the Israelis, fully back Ukraine, fully back Taiwan, and tell these adversaries that really dislike the United States or are trying to undermine us, do not act aggressively against these sovereign people. Do you worry that we're getting into a cycle of attack, response, attack, response Absolutely. between Israel and Iran? But, but, but to your point here, nobody is saying that Israel can't take action on there. Where they're saying is where they can. Just like they did on the previous 17, you don't get to hit the embassy. Nobody gets that. It's, it's an international law that we agree to. So it does matter where you take them out because that is guaranteed to prompt a response, which they ended up getting. And if we go in full in, I assure you, as bad as we thought the Iraq war, if we go full in and we get sucked into a full war here, that is absolutely not in America's interest, and we will pay a big price for that. And I need to point out one thing. The, the air defense worked brilliantly for Israel, probably the best in the world right now. Mm -hmm. But those interceptor missiles, they used a lot of them the other night. And if they get into an extended back and forth, Israel or uh, Iran can launch thousands of these drones that by themselves are easy to knock down. But if you run out of interceptor missiles, they can get through. They need to keep that in mind. I want to share a story with you of three white women from the heartland of the United States. Three ladies from Kansas went to the so-called Holy Land with their church to pay their support to the Jews and the state of Israel. They saved up their money, and it's an outrageous trip. It costs a lot of money. They went, with, they, they went with their church. Now these three ladies on land in, in the state of Israel, they went on a, on a tour. They seen all the holy sites, so-called holy sites, even though there's nothing holy about it. But they went to the zoo in Jerusalem and they believed they were looking at a miracle that can only happen in the holy land and with God's chosen people, you know, the Jews. God never called them chosen. Jesus never called them chosen, but everybody else calls them chosen. But that's, that's okay, you see, because it doesn't matter what God and the Son of God say. It only matters what delusional, batshit, crazy people in the United States and white Western culture, it only matters what they say. And if they say the Jews are God's chosen people, it must be true, because who knows more than people wearing red hats and can't pay their bills and, uh, and have, no, have no idea what's happening. These people right? The internet addicts, the TV watchers, the people that put on men who put on jerseys of black athletes who would not piss on them if they were on fire. These people surely know the truth and God, he don't know much. The son of God, Jesus, who was given all power, Matthew 28, 18, he don't know a lot either. But these men and these women, hey man, they got the answers. As they pay two and three times more for food and everything else, they got the answers, man. So these ladies were in Jerusalem at this zoo. And there was a display in an enclosure of a sheep, a lamb, and a poisonous snake. And the three ladies stared in amazement at how the lamb could survive and not be bitten by the poisonous snake. And they reasoned this is the blessing of the Jews in the Holy Land, for only in the Holy Land and God's chosen people could you put a lamb in an enclosure with the poisonous snake. And hey, the snake will never bite the lamb. For one of these ladies today, her life was going to change and she was going to be shown the truth as God loved her because God had chosen her, you see. There all comes a moment in our life when we understand some truths and then there come some big moments when you really understand a lot of big truths and you never look back because you can't look back. Now the lady told her other two friends to go on and she would catch up with them as she continued to stare at amazement at this exhibit. And she kept looking and smiling, and she noticed a Jewish zookeeper coming in her direction. She smiled and said how blessed he was and how blessed she was to be here. The zookeeper smiled, walked over her, walked over to her, 
and he proceeded to change her life because God had decided today, you're mine, and I'm going to show you the truth about these people and what you think is holy and who you think is holy because you're living a lie. And God does this with all of his children at one point in our life. The Jewish zookeeper came over to her, his smile left, and he introduced himself to her. She told him again how wonderful it was to be there and she couldn't get over the exhibit and this great blessing for the true children of God. The Jewish zookeeper stepped closer to her and he said these words that changed her life forever. He said, lady, we're not God's chosen people. It's a lie. We hate Jesus. We hate his father and we hate all you stupid church people. We hate you. We despise you. Do you know why we despise you, lady? Because we're imposters. We're not the real Israelites. We come from Cain. We use you because we can. And your God allows us to do this because you love us and not your beloved Jesus that we hate. This is why your God allows it. You stupid lady. This exhibit is a fake. The snake bites the sheep every day, and every morning we must put a new lamb in the exhibit. And lady, if you go tell your friends that I've told you all this, they won't believe you, for I'm God's chosen, and you're not. Everything here in Jerusalem, everything here in the state of Israel is an illusion. It's lies. This is a cursed land. Lady, this is where your beloved Jesus was murdered by my people. We murdered him, not the Romans. We did it. And we said, may his blood be upon us and our children. And you stupid people call it holy. We hate Jesus then and we hate him now because we know he didn't come for us. He condemned us over and over and over. You stupid, naive lady. He called us the children of the damn devil and you still call me God's chosen. Lady, I'm not an Israelite. You are. You give me money each week. When you give to your church, you're giving it there for me. You're giving it to the Jewish people in the state of Israel. And we turn around and take this money and we use it to steal your freedoms and enslave you even more. We poison your water, your food, and we mock you and Jesus every minute right to your faces. And you people do nothing. In fact, you smile. You clap and you cheer for us. As we mock you right to your face, you cheer for us. This poor woman spoke not a word. She wanted to cry, but she couldn't. She wanted to run, but she couldn't. It was as if she was being made to hear this. The Jewish zookeeper said some final words. Lady, you have a book from your God that tells you the truth about us and all things and you don't even read it. This is why we, the Jews, don't acknowledge your 1611 King James Bible. Yes, we may use the word Torah to describe the first five books of the Bible, but we don't believe that either because we know we're not God's chosen people. We have our own book, lady. It's called the Jewish Talmud, and it originated in Babylon, and it was called the Babylonian Talmud because that, that's where my people come from. We are the children of the devil, lady. Don't you get it? For Lady Jerusalem is Mystery Babylon. There's nothing holy about it. The zookeeper smiled and said, Now, go tell your husband, go tell your churchgoers, and anyone you choose. And Lady, they'll call you crazy because they see me as God's chosen. Because your God has not opened their eyes. And what we Jews fear more than anything is for your, your God to open up your eyes because then you will see us for what we truly are. We're the children of the damn devil, just like Jesus Christ said. You're Jesus. And even your own God, early on, in Genesis 3, told you there would be two different seeds upon this earth, the children of God and the children of the devil. Now you go ahead, lady, and tell them everything that I've told you. They'll laugh at you. In fact, they'll shun you. They'll ostracize you. They'll kick you out of church. Your husband will want to divorce you. Tell him anything you want. Because see, those people will see me as God's chosen. And they will say that you're damn lucky to even be in my presence. 
Just then, the ladies came back to get their friend. They, they didn't understand why she, was, she hadn't come on. And they see her talking to the zookeeper. And they approached, and the zookeeper smiled. And he said how wonderful it was to have them in the Holy Land. And he shook their hand, and he smiled. The woman that he had talked to said not a word. She stared at him. She started to feel red in the face. She started to feel strong. She started to feel angry. She started to feel things that she hadn't felt in ever in her life. She turned and looked at her friends and said, I'm ready to leave. Her friends said, sure. They assumed she meant the zoo. They had no idea she meant the state of Israel and Jerusalem. She wanted to get on a plane. She wanted to go back to the United States. She wanted to go back to Kansas to her house. When the lady got back to the hotel, she did something she hadn't done in many years. She prayed alone. And she used the name Jesus. And her heart was true. She asked God to show her the truth. On return to the States, months went by and she kept praying. She kept getting closer to her father and Jesus. She read the Bible nonstop. She couldn't put it down. She quit going to church. Her friends disowned her. The Jewish zookeeper was right. The church told her to not come back. Her husband thought she was going insane or even sick. She knew the Jehovah Father had made that zookeeper re reveal to her the truth. And for the first time, she knew the real name of God. His name is Jehovah. Not the made-up name that the Jews gave him. You see, because you can have a Tim and a Tom, and they might sound similar, but they're two different people. And this is what people do with the name of Jehovah and Jesus. They will give them other names and they'll change the J and they'll, they'll put other letters in there. But it, you're talking about two different entities, you see. Jehovah has one name. Jesus has one name. You see, Tim can be of God. Tom could be of the devil. But it's just one little letter. And this is what people do with the name game. The lady was starting to understand truths. She'd been taught by her pastor that the 1611 King James Bible was outdated, corrupt, and was not the original because the original would never speak harshly of the Jews. She got an old 1611 King James Bible from eBay. It stays by her bed, right on the nightstand. She reads it nonstop. The woman learned from her father's perfect word that the Star of David that is on the Israeli flag is the Star of the Devil. She read this in Amos 5, 26. She felt sick, but yet she felt joy. She kept praying. She kept walking with Jesus for the first time in her life. And to walk with Jesus sometimes means that you don't have friends, you see. It's not a lonely walk, because when you're walking with Jesus Christ and when you're walking with your father, you're never lonely. But you realize that Jesus, when he said, look, many are called. But only a few chosen. It really is just a few chosen. She did not walk anymore with the corrupt and vile entity called the church, who is the best friend of the synagogue of Satan. You see, for the synagogue of Satan to have the power they have, it had to count on the church. You see, it had to, even with control of the media, the radio, the early newspapers and radio, even into today and the television and the internet, it had to start with, it had to get hold of the church. And it did. Our Father is loving and he is merciful. Merciful beyond what we, what we know until we go to him and he gives us this great love and mercy. Now this story that I just told you is not true. It's a teaching that our Father had me to share with you, to show you how he chooses moments in our life when he will make sure that we get the message. And sometimes it will be hard and right to the point. Our Father is perfect. His holy word, perfect. He didn't make any mistakes. Regardless of what the crazy people say about there's 30,000 errors and God got it wrong. Imagine this though, folks. We live in a world where people that can't manage their own life will say that, you know what? God's word is wrong, but uh, I found a guy on Bit Shoot. He got it right. This is the reality of the world that you live in. I used to argue with those Nazi people, the Christian identity people, these crazy white people who believed that, yep, we're the chosen of God, but yep, God's word is wrong. 
but yet they can't manage their own lives. But some man came along from the synagogue of Satan and told them that, hey, uh, you're God's chosen people, but the Bible has 30,000 errors. But look, I I'll correct it for you. I'll make it right for you. Man, this is the world that we live in. Your ancestors would not recognize these crazy people. They would not, they would not know who they are. Truly, they're not related to us. Can you imagine the great, great granddaddies of these crazy people saying, who are these people? Who are these people? We have a wonderful, wonderful father, man. I mean, wonderful. Jehovah is wonderful. He gave you a part of himself in, in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was murdered by the Jews, not the Romans. He was kidnapped in John 18, 12 by the Jews. He was murdered by the Jews in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. The Jews did it, not the Romans. The governor, the Roman governor Pontius Pilate wanted to release Jesus. His wife even came to him and told him, look, re release that man. She even called him, he's a righteous and just man. Release him. But the Jews said, if you release him, you be no friend of Caesar's. And like every corrupt and crooked politician, even today, what did Pontius Pilate do? He gave Jesus over. You see, because very few people really love the Father and Jesus. If you look at all the billions of people that have ever walked this earth, the Father, the family that he and Jesus have is not a big one. Our Father's perfect. He gave us his image and Jesus, and he gave us his perfect word. He gave us his name, and he gave us the name of his son, and he gave us his promise and his letter to us. I'll leave you with these words, and may they move you as we walk with Jesus to the finish line in these end times. Matthew twenty-two fourteen, the words of the Master Jesus Christ, For many are called, but few are chosen. You see, folks, eight letters, excuse me, eight words, eight words, that's all it is, eight words. But this is the Son of God telling you, many are, for many are called, but few are chosen. John chapter 6, verses 44 and 65. Pay attention now. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. 65. Again, the words of Jesus. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. So who brings us to Jesus? The Father does. Count your blessings that your Father brought you to, to Jesus. Because when he brought you to Jesus, he brought you to himself and said, you're mine. And when you're mine, you're not following the hexagram people. You're not following the Jews. You're not following the synagogue of Satan. You're following Jesus. As we walk these last days, we see time starting to go fast. The days go quicker, the weeks, the months. Father is speeding things up for as he said that he would. Remember to wake up every day and seek your father's love, guidance, and help. We do this through the most precious thing your father ever, that he ever gave us. He gave you a part of himself. He gave you his image, his son, and he is your best friend, and he is Jesus. There ain't but one Jesus, one. And I'll be damned. If I'll hold hands with the people that murdered him and the people that deny him. Because I love him that much that if you're against Jesus, I'm against you. Period. You guys pray. You go to your father and you ask him to help you for anything that you need help with. Your father can't lie. Everybody else lies, but your father and Jesus can't lie. They're perfect. Every single bit of madness in this world that we're seeing, all of it, it's the means to the end. And it's getting really, really close. I thank you for being here with me today. And may the Father bless each and every one of you and this small group of people. In the name of Jesus and no other name but Jesus, I thank you for watching. Amen. Mm -hmm.